Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wristwatch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench, I have this lovely Doxa from the late 1950s that, uh, as you can see, it still runs. Uh, this, this is a running watch that we've got here, but this one actually was, uh, was given to me by some viewers of the channel. Um, Mark and his 10-year-old daughter Alexa sent this to me. And they told me that they rescued this watch from the wild. It was worn by one man every day from 1958 until 1995 when he passed away. His son threw it in a drawer for the last 27 years, and it still worked when he took it out to sell it. Um, Mark said he tried to convince him to keep it, but he wanted to sell. So they bought it and they sent it to me. And really super kind. They just said, there's no obligation for me to restore it. They thought that I would really like the dial. Cause you know, I love those patina dials and, uh, they said, I can do whatever I want with it. I can keep it. I can sell it. I can restore it if I want. So that's what we've got here. As you can see, the case is heavily pitted and, uh, really messed up. This is a plated case plated likely with nickel. And, uh, the brass is actually showing underneath as I mentioned, it is a running watch, uh, at least technically speaking, it still runs. Let's take a quick look at the inside here and kind of decide our course of action for this type of job. Wow, this Doxa actually looks really nice inside. And as you can see, it's quite happily running away as well. So that's nice. You can see there's a little bit of that green residue around the edge where the stainless steel meets the brass there. You can also see longtime viewers of this channel will know no shock protection on that jewel on the balance there. And that dates the watch, you know, to pre 1960s mostly. Let's throw it on the time grapher and see, ooh, whoa. <laughs> okay, it's not running very well. Uh, it's gaining 300 seconds a day and it's only got 120 degrees of amplitude, but that makes sense. This thing's been sitting in a drawer for 30 years and who knows how long it was before it was serviced. So uh, yeah, order number one will be let's service this watch. And I kind of have a mind to to redo the case as well. I think that it just doesn't look good that damaged. There's some amount of patina that I really appreciate on a case, but uh, oftentimes with plated cases, they can really get torn up and, and not look very good. And uh, let's take a look at this dial. You can see the crystal's pretty scratched up. Oh yeah. <laughs> now I can see what they were talking about. That is definitely the type of dial that I like. It's got that warm kind of patina on it. A lot of people think that that's just like accumulated dirt and it's not. Um, dials are actually fairly complicated. You know, there's a brass is usually the base metal, but then there's multiple layers of clear coats, printing, paint, um, ink, right? And even applied indices and numbers like we see here. And what more often happens than not when it looks like that is that the clear coat has deteriorated to the point that it's no longer able to uh, keep the discoloration away. And people think, well, I'll just get in there with a Q-tip and I'll just start scrubbing away at it and the dirt will come right off and it'll be perfect underneath. And then they realize that they take off more of the clear coat and, uh, and then the paint will come off as well and they wish that they hadn't have done anything. And that's why usually I don't do anything um, in situations like this. I know it's tempting. It looks like it just has some dirt and if you could just clean it off, it would look good. But I've done this enough times to know that that's not the case. So dial secure, hands taken off and we can start taking apart this movement. Of course, in order to do a restoration on a watch like this, we have to come up with a game plan. And the heart of any of these game plans is to get these watches running well, right? Outside of a few kind of family heirloom pieces, like maybe a pocket watch that, you know, realistically you're not gonna use to keep time. Um, you know, you really want these things to, to, to run well, right? I mean, these were made to, to tell time. And this is, a, a, like I said, a, a late 50s Doxa that had a long and productive life. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to get it running again, especially, or running well again, especially considering that it was already running. Doxa is a company that's still around today. They do not make watches that look like this anymore. Uh, their watches have a very specific look to them. Uh, they are dive watches, and 
they have what they call a kind of like a cushion case, which is a specific case design that really was popularized in the 70s. And they've kind of carried it over. They have kind of a funky look. You can get them with orange dials. And, uh, and they have cool names like Shark Hunter and stuff. But uh, but they're actually really cool, good watches. Um, but they're very different from this one. This, as you can see, is a more of an everyday type watch. This would be considered a jumbo. Uh, this watch is 37 millimeters which, you know, isn't huge by modern standards, but by 1958 standards, that is actually very large. Most of the watches from that era that you find will be somewhere in the 33, 34, maybe 35 millimeter range. Um, and if, if, if that's, if those numbers don't mean anything to you, you know, the, the Rolex that you'll see most often around, you know, a, a day date or a date just, those are 36 millimeter, the bigger ones that I've done on the channel usually hover around 40 millimeters, but I mean, you can buy watches that are massive now, if that's your thing. At any rate, these are pretty desirable for that reason, because you get that vintage charm, but it's kind of up to modern size standards because not that many people want to wear watches that are 33 or 32 or 34 millimeters um, these days. They're, they've just kind of gone out of fashion. I will say though, they are making a comeback. And I, I routinely wear 36 millimeter watches with, yeah, I love them. I think that they're really, really well sized. Taking apart the click here after getting the, uh, at least some of the train of wheels out. But yeah, the, the primary thing we're gonna do here is get this watch running well. And then we gotta make a decision on the case. I think I wanna, I think I wanna do the full deal on it. Like it just didn't look good. Maybe I'll take one more look at it after we clean it up a little bit and just see if it if it can hold up, but it did not look nice. And then uh, we'll probably get a new crystal for it because the crystal that came with it looked like it was very scratched up and also they can discolor a little bit over time and I really want to show off that dial. I think I have another idea for what to do with this watch as well. Um, I think I'm going to send it back to them so that Alexa can have this one day or Mark can wear it. I, you know, he, he said that Alexa's she's 10 and he said that she's just a huge fan of the channel. And I love that. I, you know, I think when I was a kid, I would watch <laughs> what I make, <laughs> you know, like this isn't programming for children, but obviously like it is 100% accessible to them. And when I was a kid, I liked shows like this where people took stuff apart or explained how things worked. And I think that's part of the reason why I, I started the channel was because, you know, that's the kind of stuff that I like. And I like it to this day, too. But uh, that was such a nice gesture for them to send me this watch. And I think, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to send it back to Alexa and, and Mark and uh, they can enjoy it going forward which is very motivational, right? Because now I really want to make sure this thing looks good since I'm sending it off. Okay, almost done taking apart the uh, movement side of the watch here. That's the full train of wheels now coming out. And I might as well get started on the keyless works on this side, though to fully disassemble it, we'll have to turn the movement over. can take off the uh, setting lever screw. That screw actually goes on to this side of the movement. It goes all the way down to the bottom there. And there we go. I can now start taking apart the keyless works on this side. And as you can see, there's almost nothing left. This is, you know, a time only watch that doesn't even have a, a calendar function or anything like that. So that makes it pretty easy to uh, disassemble, at least by watchmaking standards. You can see I'm going to make sure that this little sucker doesn't jump off on me. That is a very powerful spring. And uh, yeah, when they jump, they go for height and distance. And I swear to God, they try to get a new personal best every time they do as well. Okay, there's just a little tiny cover plate here that covers up the... Uh, the minute wheel and it, and there's also a little intermediate wheel there underneath it that you can't quite see that will be unveiled and I can take off those. And then I think pretty much got this thing apart. See that little intermediate wheel off to the side there, that one. 
I always check these too. They're actually um, chamfered, like they on the top they're flat, but on the bottom they tilt, they they uh, kind of shave the edges down so that they it kind of has a little bit of a cone structure that makes it smoother. But if you put it in upside down and then try to set the hands, it feels very crunchy. <laughs> it doesn't. I did that on an early watch, and I thought, Wait, is, is this thing actually different top to bottom? And I put it on the microscope and I was like, it actually is different top to bottom. And, and you know, you just learn those lessons as you uh, explore the hobby. And every time you learn one, you remember it going forward and things get easier and easier as you go. Okay, we can just replace the balance here and now we can take apart the mainspring. And I'm curious to see how this is doing. The Amplitude was very low on this watch, but that can be for numerous reasons when it hasn't been serviced in forever. But I am curious if this has an old school mainspring or, oh, it does actually have an old school. You can tell by the color of it. Um, so these are circular mainsprings. In other words, they're just wound in a circular pattern. Modern mainsprings, and, and by modern, I don't mean like 2000s. I mean, going back to the 60s, they, um, they have more like an S shape where they turn one direction and then they turn the other and that uh, creates better performance. They also use a different type of metal, but look at this one. It's just straight up circular. And look at that. It is supposed to be flat. You know, th this mainspring has definitely uh, seen its last day and we're gonna have to replace that as well. Would the watch run with that one? Yeah, it would, but that's not where we wanna be. We want it to run well. Okay, so now the next part of the process here is the cleaning. And what that means is that we need to put every single part that I just took apart from the movement into the little mesh baskets, into the bigger mesh basket, so that I can put everything into the watch cleaning machine, which will then use three chemicals to clean it and some agitation as well. So what I can do is attach this basket to this upper arm. And then what it allows you to do is plunge the basket into these three different cleaners and then this particular uh, watch cleaning machine is called a Mastermatic. And if you look, it goes back and forth. And uh, some of them only just spin in one direction. But after going through all three of those stages, we'll have a nice clean movement. Now, while the watch is cleaning, I did want to mention I have a Patreon for Wristwatch Revival. This is uh, kind of the way that you can support your favorite content out there. Um, for small content creators like me, right, I'm independent. I do everything on my own. This is kind of the lifeblood for our channels. Um, and there's a whole bunch of stuff on Patreon. Most people that do content like this, um, you know, have something so that you can support them. And if you'd like to support what I'm doing here, you can go to patreon.com slash wristwatch revival. And it's really simple to set up. You can cancel any time. There's no commitments. You get to pick the amount. You can put caps on it. It's fully in your control. You can leave, you can come back and you get a thank you card and a wristwatch revival sticker in the mail, no matter what level you sign up for, just as my way to say thank you for supporting me. And speaking of, thank you for supporting me to everybody on the Patreon. Now, this is what the movement looks like when it's all clean, and wow, did it clean up beautifully. This thing was just in need of a bath, right? Because that is lovely. Okay, but before we start to put that together, let's address this case situation. The case back is steel, so that's easy. But yeah, ah, man, even after having cleaned it, you can just see the the brass coming through, and it just doesn't look good, right? I just think this watch has another life ahead of it, and uh, I don't want to send it forward into the world looking like that. So let us redo the entire case. Now I'm going to do this by hand because I feel that even though it's a slower, kind of more tedious process, using machines um, can be a little too abrasive and you can take off too much material. Where I use these sanding sticks that go uh, kind of up, well, I should say down, up, I don't know. The numbers get higher, which means that they become less abrasive. So I start off with the more abrasive one to kind of get the rough edges and to take off that outer layer of plating that's still on. And then I move my way to the finer grain so that it'll get that nice finish. The key here when it comes to plating is prep because you absolutely have to get it exactly how you want it to look before you do the electroplating process. If you do not do that, the process will not hide anything. It will not 
cover up mistakes, scratches, dings. Look, this case isn't going to be perfect no matter what. But, you know, we want to get this thing looking way better than we had it before. And in order to do so, I need to get it polished up and looking basically how I expect it to look when it's done. And then I can apply the plating. As you can see, it looks pretty good. Definitely an improvement over where we were before. Now I have to do this on the main case as well, not just the bezel, of course. And so I'm gonna start off by just doing one of the lugs and I'll show you what that looks like. And then I'll do the rest. Uh, you know, you don't have to sit here and watch me do every little inch. It's kind of therapeutic, by the way, to do this, Sandy. And I like to put on one of my favorite movies and just get to get busy on one of these things. So you can see the lug on the right and then the, the other one are uh, quite a bit different with the, with the uh, plating gone. Okay, so this is my plating setup that I have at home. That's a power supply on the right and on the left is a little heating plate that I can put the various solutions onto. It also has this little pill thing at the bottom that's attached to a magnet so that it can agitate it and make sure that bubbles can't form on it. So the first thing we need to do is to make sure that this case is absolutely 100% clean. And the way to do that is to put it through the ultrasonic cleaner, maybe put it in some alcohol, and now put it in an electro cleaning process. This actually runs electricity through the parts, which is what I'm about to do here. And that forces any oil, debris, anything that was still on there off of the case. In fact, you can actually see the bubbles coming off as the case gets cleaned. This is the last process to ensure full cleaning on that case. And it does a very good job. Um, and then what I can do is rinse it off in distilled water. And then I, I try not to touch it. You know, I'm wearing gloves like to make sure, definitely wouldn't touch it with my bare hands. And it's one of those things where paying attention to detail for this process really matters. Now this is, this green stuff is a solution for nickel plating. And so I'm gonna do basically the same process I did for the electro cleaning, but this time it's reversed. So instead of this, the electro process pushing particles away, it is going to draw them to the case. And since there's nickel in that green solution, it will be picked up and adhered to the case. So there we go. After it's been in there for about 20 minutes, a lot of trial and error, by the way, to get to this point, but now I kind of, I have it all written down how I do it. I can take the, uh, the case parts out and once again, rinse them off in um, distilled water. And then we can take a look at what we've got and take a look at this. Way, way, way better than before. Take a look at that. Yeah, it's not 100% perfect. The thing is you have to draw the line at how much material you actually wanna take off of a case like this. But as you can see, way better and I'm really happy with the result. I think it's gonna really breathe new life into this watch. And with that case out of the way, we can start the process of reassembling the movement. Now, older movements like this, even a simple one like this, again, I, I mentioned this is a time only movement. It keeps hours, minutes, and seconds, that's it. Um, they are quite a bit more work than a mo more modern movement, mainly because of how you have to oil some of the parts. And well, we're gonna do that here today. So you're, you get to come along with me for that part of the journey for sure. But we'll start off with a brand new mainspring. And this is a modern mainspring. This is with the design that uses a much better alloy that's much stronger. They actually used to call these unbreakable mainsprings. <laughs> uh, they weren't allowed to call that anymore because they still can break. But I mean, these things really do last a long time. And they're that other shape as well. So it should be much better suited for the watch. Now that the mainspring's in, I can just uh, close it up using this little tool. And now we can begin the rebuild process on this movement. Now this part of it is pretty straightforward by watch movement standards. I, it's funny because I, I listen to myself say like, oh, this is pretty straightforward, but it's like, no, th there, there's 50 parts spread out across your bench and you have to know what order to put them in and which screw goes where. None of this stuff is, is you know, really straightforward, but in the context of watchmaking, it's straightforward. Um, Again, until you get to some of the jewels and stuff that you have to do quite a bit more work on. But this part's, uh, you know, kind of what we're used to here on the channel. So that's just center, center wheel in the middle there. And then there's this little bridge that holds it in place. So we have to start off by doing that. And then we can put the rest of the train of wheels into place as well.
You can see two screws hold this in place. Sometimes people ask, how do you know how much uh, torque to put on the screw? They ask if it's done by feel or if there's like a tool that you can use to, uh, to make sure it's exactly right. And the answer is it's done by feel. The answer is also that there is technically a tool that you can use. There's a little tiny baby torque wrench that you can get for these. I've seen one online. It was pretty funny. I don't know anybody who actually uses one, even people who are uh, professional, you know, full-time watchmakers. Um, I've never seen anybody use one, but um, yeah, you do it by feel. Some of the screws require, you know, a decent amount of torque. I mean, you're not doing anything crazy on these, right? But some of them require a deft touch because they can actually break. And speaking of a deft touch, you know, there's a lot of patience that's needed for watchmaking. And this is a good example of getting these wheels set into place correctly. They kind of don't want to sit right. And you just have to sit there and wrestle with them for a while. It's just how it works. I feel lucky that doing this as, as more of a hobby for me, you know, I can really take my time and learn it and really kind of dive in. I think if I had the pressure of needing to get through some number of movements every day so that, you know, I could make my paycheck and all that stuff, um, that would be different. That, that would be uh, a lot harder. I also think I would be um, not as good at it. Like, I, you know, being able to take my time when I first started the hobby really pays off later when it starts to become second nature after I really understand what's going on. All right, here is the uh, train wheel bridge. As you can see, there's three ruby jewels in the middle, and those each have a pivot that go into them. So that's a like an axle for each of those wheels. But the tricky part is they all have to be lined up perfectly. So as you see, I tried to spin it, and it wouldn't spin. Okay, now things are spinning at least a little bit. But as you can see, the escape wheel down at the bottom there is not spinning. So it's not engaged. Nope. Still not spinning, so more tweaking needed. Oh, there it goes, got it. And you can see the escape wheel down there in the lower left, then it was spinning, right? And again, it's just a patience thing. You just have to keep, tweak, try, tweak, try. The, the times when you get in trouble <laughs> is when you lose your patience, right? That, that is where you, know, you just say, well, I want this thing just go together, and, uh, and you get frustrated, and, and that's when... Uh, <laughs> That's when you can break stuff. Okay, a little bit of lubrication here between the barrel and the barrel bridge that it sits on. And this is a shim that goes around the crown wheel. I'll put a little bit of lubrication here as well. For the most part, we use three different types of lubrication, or at least I do. Um, medium, light, and heavy, if you will. The heavy is like a grease. The medium lighter are synthetic oils. And I've been using the medium for these parts here. You don't want to gum things up. And watch this too. If you look closely, I turn that screw the wrong way. And that is often the case that that screw is a reverse threaded screw. It's another reason why you don't want to force things, right? If, if you're trying to be the the torque monster and like, oh, I'm just going to screw this down. It's never going to come undone. In that case, when you were trying to remove that screw, if you were just going in there full bore, you would strip the, the head because you'd be turning it the wrong direction and you would be doing it way too hard. And, and that, that's happen that happens all the time that the thread just gets stripped right out. Okay, now we can put the ratchet wheel up. And interestingly, the ratchet wheel is not reverse threaded. They'll usually use reverse threaded screws on things that turn in the same direction that would undo the screw. That isn't the case for the ratchet wheel, but it is for the crown wheel. And so that way, you know, you don't have it where you're constantly turning a thing that could bump up against that screw, grab it, and then unturn the screw as well. Okay, flipping the movement over, We've already got the train of wheels in place. I mean, this thing, that, that part comes together very quickly. And now I can start on the keyless works on the other side. 
This is where the stem with the crown on it that you actually wind goes into the watch. A little bit of medium viscosity oil here for these posts. There will be wheels and springs. This is the blue stuff is actually the heavier grease, but I just need a little tiny bit as I put the cannon pinion back on. This is friction fit, so I have to press down like that and then it kind of clicks into place. A Little bit of oil there where this will meet up with the sliding clutch, just, you know, make sure things are moving freely. And this is the one. The born to fly spring, you know it. And I'm gonna be as careful as I can because watch how much uh, action I have to put on this spring to get it to sit. Nope, not like that. <laughs> Ugh, like that, <laughs> right? I mean, can you see how much tension is being held under that spring? It is a lot. I also, could have made my life a little easier. As you see, I, I need to seat that yoke into place, but I have not put in the crown and the stem yet. And that helps to kind of stabilize. And I probably should have put that in first. Just, I'm not really worried about it, but like just procedurally, it would be better. Taking a look at the crown itself, by the way, as you can see, the edges are worn off and uh, the plating's gone on those. So I'm gonna replace the crown on this too. No point in doing a whole shiny new replated case if we don't have a crown to match. So I'm gonna pick a crown that looks about the same size and vibe, if you will, of the original. And this looks about right. Yeah. And so now I'm just gonna put the, uh, the crown on here because I do need to put the stem in like I mentioned to uh, continue the rebuild. So hopefully the crown won't require any uh, trimming of the stem. Sometimes the length can be a little bit different, but we'll see here. Okay, no, that looks good. Now we won't know about the, the stem length until we get the uh, case going, but we're not quite there yet as you can see. Still working on the keyless works here after replacing the crown. And there's that intermediate wheel. Again, we have to make sure that the rounded part is pointed down. And now I can finally put on the setting lever spring. And the reason that I want to get the setting lever spring on is not for the setting lever spring part, it's for the cover. It, it, it also acts as a cover for much of the keyless works to kind of just keep everything flat and contained, including the born to fly spring. And uh, it has just been sitting there, you know, waiting to jump out. And so now I can finally breathe a little bit of relief that I've got it secured. And as you can see, the keyless works looks like it's working properly. Now, in order for it to work properly for a long time and at its best, I need to use some grease here uh, on exactly where that setting lever spring engages with setting lever. And as you can see, I made a bit of a mess of it here. I, you really don't want that much extra grease floating around. So I'm just gonna use some Rotico to, to pick it up. Rotico is like silly putty for watchmakers. You can use it for to hold parts, to clean stuff up. It's just sort of an, an inert moldable substance that you can use. It's really handy. Okay, this little cover plate is the last part to go on here on the, uh, we call this the dial side, by the way, of the movement. The dial will sit directly on top of this part of the movement when we reattach it. Okay, now back on the movement side, I can put on the pallet fork and the pallet fork bridge, and then we can put the balance back on and see if it's gonna run for us, and if so, how well. This is always tricky business because once again, you're dealing with pivots and jewels, right? I mentioned those before when I was putting on that plate that you can see right there. And this one only has one, but it does need to be lined up. And one way you can test it is to wind the watch a little and just gently touch the sides of the pallet fork. And when it goes back and forth on its own like that, that means that it's usually in the pivots, in the pivot holes.
And one quick check, see that, how it goes back and forth? Now I'm checking that again before fully tightening down this pallet fork bridge. And the reason is that sometimes it'll be like a little bit crooked and if you go for the torque on it, boom, you'll snap one of those pivots and have to get a new pallet fork. Okay, now we can put on the balance and let's see if it's gonna run for us. I expect it to. <laughs> you better run, watch. Oh, uh. Okay, yes, it is in fact running. And uh, and that's good news, right? I mean, again, it was running before, so it better run now. But um, but still, it's a, it's a sigh of relief uh, whenever a watch kicks back up again, because we did have the whole thing apart. There could be parts that are corroded or broken or, or were so gunked up that they were still kind of holding together, but when you clean them, then they don't. But as you can see, it's, it's humming right along here, so we're okay there, but... This is the part I was talking about. Now I need to let down the mainspring again. And we need to do some oiling on this watch. And that the most difficult part about working on an older watch like this that doesn't have a shock protection system is this, the balance, is getting the balance properly oiled. And this is a tricky and somewhat risky and somewhat tedious process that we have to do, but we got to do it, you know, to get this thing running the best it can. That jewel is the most important one on the whole watch. It is under the most stress out of any of them. It oscillates literally thousands of times per hour. So the way to do this though, is I have to completely disassemble the balance. So first things first, I use my very smallest screwdriver, the orange one. I believe it's half a millimeter and take off the balance wheel. That leaves me with the balance bridge here. And do you see those two tiny screws right there? Now I need to take those off. <laughs> uh, yes, those. And I swear these are the tiniest screws you've ever seen. It is so funny that we somehow as a civilization came to the point that we could make functional screws this size and actually found uses for them. You can see them right there. There. <laughs> it's also funny because I looked up how they made these things and they made them on this massive machine. <laughs> it's just, it's like takes up half a room and it spits out these little tiny baby screws. And as you can see, these two parts come across, come apart as well. So we've got the cap jewel, we've got the balance bridge with a hole jewel in it, we have the arm for the regulator, and then we have the balance wheel with the balance spring itself. And so what I'm gonna do is even though these parts did go through the watch cleaning machine, I'm gonna individually clean them in a solution called One Dip. It's a solvent that will help uh, dissolve any oils or dirts that may still be there, especially on these parts like this one that I have taken apart now, because those were still sandwiched together when they went through the watch cleaning machine. And I wanna make sure that they get perfectly clean as well. Again, because they're under a lot of friction and a lot of load at all times. So I can use an air blower here just to dry off the parts, but taking a look here at the cap jewel, I need to put a droplet of oil on the cap jewel here that isn't flooding over the side, but is also enough to properly lubricate the watch. And that's what we've got here, bingo. So now this is the really, really tricky part. So I lay this on a little bed of Rotico that I've made. Then I can put the balance bridge on it lined up, but these can't be rubbing around on each other very much because it'll displace that oil otherwise. Then I can take the little tiny, tiny speck of dust size screws, put those on and then secure that part to it so that it'll keep the oil in the place where it needs to be. Careful. Okay, there we go. So now I can finish screwing down the other screw here. And as you can see, we've got it. So now we've got the cap jewel secured to the whole jewel with proper lubrication in there, but I'm not done yet. So now I need to put on the regulator arm. So if you've never seen inside of a watch before, this arm right here is adjustable. And this is what um, allows you to adjust the rate of the watch, meaning 
if it's running a little bit fast or a little bit slow, you can use this arm to tweak it to get it, you know, running perfect. The way it works is also quite interesting. If you look at that uh, spring, that blue spring in the middle there, very fragile, by the way. I have to be extremely careful with this part of it uh, because I have to use a screwdriver to secure that spring to the balance, the screwdriver. And if you slip and jam it into the spring, it can break it really easily. So it's just very delicate work. But anyway, that regulation arm actually effectively lengthens and shortens the, the length of that spring. And if it's shorter, it runs faster. And if it's longer, it runs a little bit slower. Okay, now speaking of oiling, we still need to oil up the jewels on the movement itself. These are all just whole jewels, right? You can see the pivot and you can see that it's a whole. Uh, it's made of synthetic ruby, which is uh, just under diamonds on the hardness scale. And I can also show you this part. So that is the pallet fork and it requires a special lubricant just on the very tip of the pallet fork. And Okay, we'll, we'll call that good, but ideally there isn't any oil anywhere else, right? It's only on the very tip of the pallet fork. I find it very difficult to do on the microscope, um, you know, under the camera, so I, I often don't show it, but I did wanna show it here just because it is an important part of the process. Now, what I have here is the bottom jewel for the balance, but thankfully, this one's much easier. I can remove the, the jewel here, as you can see, clean it up. I can use a little bit of peg wood here also to clean off any uh, residual oil that may have dried up on it. Just a little bit of manual cleaning will, will take care of that. Another quick splash in the one dip, and now I can once again apply the droplet of oil. As you can see, though, th this doesn't carry the risk and the stress that uh, working on the actual balance bridge does because now I can put this one in place. And as long as I'm careful, the oil will stay in place. Another little tiny screw. And that is secure as well. And now the last thing to do, because we're done with all the lubrication and everything, is to put this balance back on again get this bad boy running, and then we can put her on the time grapher and see what we've got. It's an eager machine. You can see it kicks right up to life. And now that it's all been completely cleaned and lubricated, it should be running very smoothly. I am curious to see what the numbers look like though, because they were really, really bad. You know, when we started 120 degrees of amplitude is way too low. And... Ooh, much better, 230 degrees of amplitude, 238 actually, and uh, a much better rate, five seconds a day. The beat error is still off, but not off enough for me to risk once again taking apart the balance to try to fix it. Um, look, on these older watches, it's too risky. It just is, you can break the, the hairspring and then you don't have, I, I don't even know where I'd get parts for this watch. So I'm gonna leave it as is and move on. As we uh, wrap this thing up, I still have to take care of this case. And part of the case, of course, is the crystal. And as I mentioned, the crystal was discolored as well as heavily worn. And I really wanna show off the cool patina on the dial. So uh, we're gonna replace the crystal here. And what I'm using is a crystal press to do so. Once it gets, once the crystal is shrunk down by pressing down, you can put the bezel around it and then unleash that tension and it, the crystal will stay in by itself. Take a look, much better. Look how much better this whole thing looks, by the way. <laughs> it's like a huge difference. Okay, last steps now uh, for the uh, movement and to get everything back together, we can put the hour hand on. This is called a dial washer. It just makes sure that that, that uh, hour wheel stays put, doesn't move around. Now we can put the dial itself back on. This is a really charming watch. Very typical for its era. I'm gonna use a little leather pad here just to brush off the indices. I'm not using this on the dial itself, but just to uh, get any corrosion or anything like that off the indices, just to you know, shine them up a little bit. And now we can put the hands back on. I've got a hand press tool. There's multiple tools that you can use to do this. There's a handheld one, which I actually have on my little tray right there with the red tip. But 
um, I got this thing for Christmas and this thing's awesome. This hand press tool allows you to line up everything really well and uh, makes the job just a lot easier. It can just be difficult to get the hand press tool exactly uh, parallel or perpendicular, I mean, to the uh, dial. And uh, this tool makes that very easy. So there's the hour and minute hand. And then the last one, of course, to go on is just the seconds hand. And it's a little tricky to get it seated, but once it sits, you can see when it's seated because it'll start turning like that. And then just a little press on the side there to uh, to make it stick. And just a quick check also to make sure the hands aren't touching each other when you turn them. Sometimes they can bump into each other. That'll stop the whole watch. So you just need to test that. And I'm just going to put the crystal in place, but not secure it yet. And what this will allow me to do is flip the watch on its face. And that way uh, the hands don't get damaged because I do need to put in this new crown with the stem and make sure that it's gonna fit and work well. Let's see if I can handset. Yeah, okay, good. So I didn't actually need to do any resizing of the stem, which is nice as well. This is just a case screw. So this just holds the movement up against the case so that it doesn't rattle around in there. I gotta be careful turning it over because I still haven't actually put this bezel back on. And before I do that, I'm gonna use a little bit of air here to make sure that there's no dust or debris under there. And then I think I could just push it back together. I got the case back, which is stainless steel, by the way. And yeah, there we go. It clicked right back together. And oh my God, this watch is looking really good. It does need a watch strap on it. I've got a few to choose from. Oh, and a quick check here as well. Yep, that looks good. Um, but yeah, oh man, <laughs> actually really stoked about how good this thing came out. Boy, the replating job really helped. But yeah, I could put a new watch strap on this thing and we can call it a project. Um, I'm really happy with how this turned out and I'm really excited to send it back to its, its new owners uh, once again. I really thought that was cool that they sent this thing in. And I really think it's cool that Alexa watches the channel uh, at just 10, 10 years old. I, I just, I think that's really special and uh, it makes me proud to do this channel. Um, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you coming along with me for this journey as we re restored this Doxa from the uh, 1950s. I think it came out really nice. Uh, I do have an Instagram for the channel. If you'd like to find me over on Instagram, it's wristwatch underscore revival. I'll post pictures of my projects. Whenever I post a video, I'll post over there as well. And you can stop by and say hi. Thank you once again for hanging out with me for this journey. And we'll see you next time.